here. Our lecture is about to begin, so I'd like to please ask you to take your seats and make sure to turn off your cell phones. This lecture is being recorded today, um, so any noises, any conversations you're having will be picked up by our recording devices. So we just ask you to please uh, be respectful of the speaker. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank our sponsors, Town of North Beach, uh, for the use of their town hall today. Um, our town council member, Mickey, he's here helping us out with all the technical stuff because I'm not a computer person. <laughs> uh, the Bayside History Museum. My name is Vincent Turner. I'm the vice president of the Bayside History Museum. I'm standing in for Grace Mary Brady today. Um, she could not make it to the lecture. Um, we'd like to also thank the Calvert Library and the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, for helping sponsor this lecture today. Our speaker this afternoon is Donald Schmidt. He served on the staff of the Library of Congress as the head of graphics for about 20 years. Um, he also served as the director of Nautical Archaeological Associates, uh, which was a nonprofit organization. And this organization conducted the first underwater archaeological surveys in the state of Maryland. Um, so today he'll be talking about a shipwreck on the Chesapeake, so he has lots of experience. Um, at the end of our lecture today, we'll have about 15 minutes for question and answer. So if you have any questions, make sure to ask him, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, as a marine archaeologist, he's worked um, in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe. Um, he's also authored numerous scientific articles in over 20 books. Um, he has a, a book that's coming out soon called Siege, the Canadian Campaign in the American Revolution. So be sure to keep your eye out for that one. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Donald Chimet. Thank you, Vince. Um, today, I'm going to discuss something I guess we have on a number of people here from the Mayflower Society. I'm going to discuss something uh, that is an American icon, which has a connection to the Chesapeake Bay. Most people don't know that. We create our icons rather indiscriminately, and they do things that have a great effect on our society. We're a young nation. I'm one-third of the age of our nation, which is pretty old. Uh, but our nation is pretty young. And the consequence of that is in the process of becoming a nation, we have, we have developed certain icons around which we develop our history. Today I'm going to be talking about the Mayflower, a Mayflower, the Mayflower, or possibly the Mayflower, uh, all of which have a connection. And they range the entirety of the founding period of our country, from Massachusetts to Florida. So in order to do this, uh, we're going to have to break down some icons. We're going to have to address some of them in what the historic record has told us. And one of those icons, which I'm not going to break down, but I'm going to enhance, is the Mayflower. And in order to put it in the context of the times, we have to go back to the very beginning. And the beginning, of course, <clears throat> not counting the people who were here 20,000 years earlier, uh, the first Europeans, of course, are coming over with after this fellow here. What we don't realize is that in that 100-year period after the Spanish have come, we start creating our icons. In the 1930s, up until the 1930s, for a great part of American academia and the American public and every school child, history began at Plymouth Rock, which of course doesn't exist. Plymouth Rock doesn't exist. But it begins with, with the Puritans. Until the 1930s, the New England Brahmins of education spreading the gospel of the Mayflower, um, had to kind of eat turkey a little bit in the 1930s when the discipline of underwater uh, marine archaeology, uh, I'm sorry, um, 
archaeology, historic archaeology, begins, and they start excavating at Jamestown. Oops, here's a place that started a little bit before uh, the Puritans arrived. But we can go back way before that. We go back to 1513, when a Spaniard lands in Florida, and soon after that, a guy named Cortez is capturing the world in Mexico, in South America, in Central America. The concept of what America was, uh, John D. and others, is that it was just a way to get to Japan. It's just an obstruction in the way. We had no idea of what it was. The Spanish look at it as uh, who are here and are starting right away. They're developing properties, they're developing uh, towns and cities and lands and so forth, and exploiting the natives. Mountains of silver, Potosi, the, the, the robbery, robbery of the Incas and the Aztecs, the Mayans, destroying whole civilizations. This is even well before we were even thought of. And in a very short time, of course, the Spanish have settled the West Indies. They've settled Mexico. They've settled um, parts of South America, followed soon after by the Portuguese. And they're exploring the West well before anybody thought of coming up here. So in that context, the Mayflower is a journey come lately. By the time that the English are starting to look into the Americas, the Spanish have already settled and they are here in abundance. Spain becomes the richest empire in the world. Let's go back there a bit. Um, they're building fortifications all over. This is Veracruz, 1519, the same year. It's founded the same year that Cortes is capturing and destroying Montezuma and uh, Mexico City, becoming the center of the Spanish Empire. They build the largest city, the largest fortification in the Western Hemisphere very soon after that, at Cartagena, in what is now Colombia. If you've ever been there, you will see those walls, those massive walls, which have resisted siege after siege, uh, become uh, a symbol, because they are a part of the Spanish Empire in which the treasure fleets 300 ships at a time are sailing for uh, home, carrying the treasures of the Americas and the treasures of the conquered peoples. Well, finally, this fellow, uh, this lady, uh, Queen Elizabeth, daughter of Henry VIII, Henry VIII, who decides he wants to divorce one of his wives, and the Pope won't let him, decides he's going to create the Church of England. Very pivotal, the Church of England, Anglican Church, separate from the papacy, separate in many ways, which we will address in a minute. Well, Elizabeth is smitten with expansion. She's smitten by this guy here. <coughs> Man, what a dude. <laughs> I like that one of them. Um, I like the bows around the necks. Uh, but his, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, whose interest in the Americas, of course, in 1584, 1584, how many years is that after 1492, when finally the English are starting to come, and he sets up the colony at Roanoke Island. This is the earliest map of Roanoke Island. And the consequence of that effort to establish is the first, of course, English effort, which doesn't do very well. They build a fort, which is now underwater at the north end of the island, um, and it still hasn't been identified, but it's probably there. And the people there, by the time uh, the second expedition is over to visit them, they're not there. Uh, a fellow named John White, who had been there, on, is one of the first, uh, I guess you would call them ethnographers, who is documenting the people, the places, the, the um, environment, the animals of, of the Americas for the first time by the English. 
And he comes back and he's going, where the heck did everybody go? Well, about that time, the Spanish, who claim the entirety of the Atlantic seaboard, at least as far as the Chesapeake Bay, which they call Bahia de Santa Maria, or Bahia de Madre Dios, the Bay of the Mother of God, they send an expedition to wipe out that colony. They overshoot it, and they end up going into the Chesapeake Bay. And in 1588, it becomes the first effort, unintentional, to explore the Chesapeake. They go all the way up, they destroy, uh, discover the uh, Potomac River, the Rio San Pedro. They go further north, they get all the way up to the Northeast River, get out overland, walk overland, still looking for that colony as far as, probably as far as Philadelphia is today. And then they come home and go, eh, hey, they're not there. They sail all the way up from the Presidio of San, St. Augustine in Florida, the oldest city in America. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this is, the English don't know what's here. They did send an expedition, or a couple of guys, uh, from Roanoke Island. They go all the way up, and you can see where the Chesapeake Bay is. That's as far as they knew of anything. It's still considered a possible route to the Indies. But there are other goals here. There are other goals because of gold and silver and the treasures of the Indies, which are going to be found, of course, in Virginia. Uh, the, the Virginia Company is founded, whoops, and they send a, well, we're really moving fast here. The Virginia Company is founded, and in 1606 they organize an expedition and the expedition, of course, comes not there. They come this way. And, of course, we have the Susan Constant, the Discovery, and the Godspeed, who come into uh, the James River, and we all know the story of Jamestown and its settlement. As we think we know the story of the Mayflower. And the James River, they, of course, come up, and they put ashore, and these guys are all gentlemen. They can barely survive. Half of them don't make it. Uh, but the settlement does survive, and it does have some strong <coughs> leadership. A fellow named John Smith is among them. And John Smith provides uh, some military guidance, exploratory guidance, and he's a very strong character. Most people don't know about John Smith, by the way. Everybody knows John Smith from the Chesapeake. But did you know John Smith actually fought the Turks? He actually fought on horseback in the old medieval, tra medieval tradition of jousting against the Turkish lord. He was captured, ended up somehow in Russia, walked all the way across Europe, and then comes to Virginia. <laughs> Incredible guy. Incredible guy. John Smith is just one of those adventurers that we just don't know the whole story on. But Virginia establishes some type of order, some type of government, which is pretty good because they got to stand up against these guys. Around them is an enormous number of uh, Native Americans. And go back here, you can see where Jamestown is and all of the uh, Natives. Uh, it's basically a Native empire under Powhatan. Very advanced, good government, strong people, and somehow the Jamestown settlement survives, uh, despite themselves. John Smith, 1608, goes out. Now, this is important. Time, 1608, 1609, 1607. John Smith goes out and starts to explore the Chesapeake Bay, all the way up to the head of the bay, all the way up the rivers, the Patuxent, the Potomac, uh, the Rappahannock, and his explorations provide the first unified map of the Chesapeake Bay, which was in use for almost uh, 75 to 100 years afterwards. But in 1608, 1607, things are happening in Europe, just as this is happening. I was talking about the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church is the strong state church of England. And it has as many new institutions do as splinter groups. And one of those splinter groups are the Puritans. 
They be, they're extremists. They would be called extremists today uh, in the time. And they were also known as separatists. 1608, 1607, and laws are eventually instituted that drive them out. They go to Europe, they go to the Calvinist state of the Netherlands, they sail for Leiden. The leaders of the church, the leaders of the group, start teaching at Leiden University. A number of the people there, they're all fairly educated, fairly uh, uh, well read, but they find it very difficult living there as well. So they decide they're going to go someplace where nobody's going to get them. And that's in the New World. The company is formed, of course. We all know about the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, the ob objective, of course, is to find religious freedom. And they organize this expedition. The expedition is going to the Americas. And it is going to be bound uh, for not Cape Cod, not Massachusetts, but the Hudson River. Why are they going to the Hudson River? Well, it's already been discovered. Hendrick Hudson discovered it. But they're going to the Hudson River because it's a temperate climate. It's been noted as being fairly rich uh, and, and uh, fertile. And so they head for the Hudson River. Not a good move. The Hudson Valley is really a great place. Unfortunately, the Dutch get there before them, but they, they never get there because they get driven off by a storm. They've hired two ships. One of the ships doesn't, uh, doesn't meet muster, but the second ship, uh, a ship called Mayflower, does. The Mayflower is commanded by a man who is uh, named Jones, who is a very um, erudite fellow. Uh, the ship has been used as a trader in Europe, um, probably built around 1609. We don't know exactly, but anyhow, when the, that ship uh, is brought and loaded up and sails for the Americas, she's got 102 passengers and 20 to 25 um, seamen on board, and she happens to have a difficult time crossing, uh, more than 60-some days in crossing bad weather, and she gets blown off course. And she ends up, of course, uh, where we all know today up there in Massachusetts. She gets driven into um, the coast of Cape Cod. Anybody know Cape Cod's history? No, it's a ship's graveyard. But they end up not going there. They, got, they, they decide to look a little further south. So they head on down the coast, down to what is we call Monomoy today. They see this rocky coast, they go, no, we can't go there. Let's, let's go ashore. So before they go ashore, just before they go ashore on November 11th, you know what November is like in Massachusetts. Uh, before they go ashore, they draft themselves some laws, the Mayflower Compact which stays in effect in that colony into the 1690s. So, uh, which is a pretty, pretty impressive thing. Of course, when they do go ashore, it is horrible. Only half of those people will live through the next year. Uh, ultimately, this fellow, although the first governor doesn't quite reach the, reach the goal, uh, this fellow, um, Bradford, govern, uh, go becomes Governor William Bradford, whose diary, whose journal, is what we really place a lot of the Mayflower story on. Um, he becomes governor, and he is the leader of the colony. And, of course, the following year we have, we have the Thanksgiving, uh, which is actually kind of a minor affair, but we make it a national thing um, in the later years. Now, what is interesting is this is in November uh, 1620. And what is happening elsewhere in the colonies? In that same year, another fellow, his name is William Claiborne, comes to Maryland. What is now Maryland, actually he comes to Virginia. And William Claiborne comes over as a surveyor. He becomes 
ultimately the treasurer of Virginia, and at one point during Protestant Catholic ups upheavals, he becomes one of the administrators of Maryland. But William Claiborne sees the uh, prospects here. And one of the prospects is this new interest in American fur. It becomes uh, a fashion item in Europe. It becomes a really valuable thing. William Claiborne wants to profiteer on that. So he goes up all the way up the Chesapeake to Kent Island, named after Kent, England, and he establishes a settlement there in 1631. That's three years before Lord Baltimore came, but it's the same year that the Puritans, the Pilgrims, are landing in New England. William Claiborne establishes a settlement on Kent Island, and what he is going to be doing, he is going to be trading with Susquehannock, Susquehannock Indians way up the bay. Those Indians have access to the fur trade coming down from uh, as far north as the Finger Lakes. So that trade is incredibly valuable. He forms a company with a European, with an English company called Cloberry, and Cloberry and Company and William Claiborne become like that. So this operation goes on, and it is an ongoing thing. Uh, which is rather interesting in Maryland history because it is the first permanent European settlement in Maryland, what is now Maryland, on Kent Island, on the south end of the island. It is the first, the first uh, homes, the first construction for uh, men and women. They have the first women coming over. They have the, uh, the first, uh, first shipbuilding in Maryland. They have the first everything. They have the first church. They have the first tobacco farming. It's the first importation of slaves. But it is also very attractive for other people. One of those people is a fellow who attempted to make a settlement up in Canada, or in Nova Scotia, at, they call it Avalon, and his name was Lord Cecil Calvert, a Catholic. Lord Calvert, uh, unlike William Claiborne, Claiborne got a, what is called a signet, from the, uh, a lord in Scotland, but, William, uh, but uh, Cecil Calvert got a, got a patent on the land of what is now Maryland from the King Charles, King Charles II of England. And that patent was really very important because they go to war over it. When the, the colonists come in from Maryland under Leonard Calvert, the Ark and the Dove, they come into the Chesapeake, and unlike the other colonists that have attempted with fighting the Indians and everything, they settle pretty well. The St. Mary's City is established, and it becomes the capital of Maryland and holds on for some years as such. It is an ongoing thing. Now, when this settlement is founded, uh, William Claiborne, of course, is doing his trading with the Indians, and he owns Kent Island. A war breaks out between Kent Island, William Claiborne, and St. Mary City. Now what is happening in this period that links us to the Mayflower? Well, we have to go meet a guy named Samuel Vassal. Now Samuel Vassal is a descendant of Huguenots. He is a Puritan. His son John is a settler in the new colony of Massachusetts Bay. He is not, he's not a settler, I'm sorry, he's a 25% owner. His brother, William, is a settler. William Vassal ends up fighting, uh, having disputes over doctrine with uh, Bradford and is expunged from the colony and founds the city, uh, the town of Skituit. William's grandson founds the town of Vesselboro in Maine. But Samuel, now Samuel's got an interest in everything. Samuel had an interest in the Massachusetts Bay Company. Samuel had an interest in the Virginia Company, I mean shares in all of these. And Samuel will have an interest in another company which is 
uh, gets a patent from the King of England, Charles, uh, to his Attorney General, or the equivalent of Attorney General, a fellow named Heath. And Heath gets a patent for lands in Carolina in the 1630s. And who is going to be a partner in that? Samuel Vassal. Well, at that time, we have Spanish Florida, we have Massachusetts, we have the Dutch now coming into the, the Hudson, and we have Virginia. But the land between Virginia and Florida is kind of a no-man's land. The Virginians claim it, the Spanish claim it, the Spanish um, actually expunged the British from coming in. But an expedition is fitted out uh, under the company, and the company hires a ship. Actually, it hires two ships. One of the ships is called George, and one of the ships is called Mayflower. Mayflower uh, is to be commanded by this fellow here, Peter Andrews. Indeed, he had been a commander of that ship for a number of years. Mayflower is loaded because the other ship, the George, which is supposed to explore the coast, has problems. So the expedition is going to be led by a fellow named Edward, King, Edward Kingswell, and they're going to go into what is now South Carolina. They're going to go to St. Helena Sound, not far from the uh, Marine Corps base down there, Camp Lejeune, uh, not far from where the uh, French attempted a settlement uh, and were killed, wiped out by the Spanish. The expedition has um, uh, Kingswell's family, his wife, his brother and sister, his brother-in-law and sister, and uh, a couple of uh, others, and about 45 other people and they make the crossing. It's a desperate crossing of the Atlantic. They don't make the Carolinas. Where do they make? This Mayflower makes it to the Chesapeake Bay. She comes into the Chesapeake Bay. All she's got is the maps that they had, which happens to be John Smith's map. Uh, she comes into the Chesapeake Bay and she goes into the James River. She goes up the river to yet another settlement that has been founded, Martin's Hundred, and she is there in the beginning of 1634. The Mayflower is kind of locked in because it's bad weather, the winter is there, but William Claiborne, whose settlement is up the, up the bay, has a problem in supplying his, um, his uh, settlement, and he agrees to, he, the captain, uh, Andrews, agrees to hire the ship out to carry supplies to Kent Island. They're going to go up to Kent Island. Um, we don't know anything about the visit. And this is only alluded to in later lawsuits, which I will get to in a minute. But we do know that she definitely was, this, this Mayflower was in the bay and uh, delivered something to Kent Island. We don't know what. That March, Kingswell is really ticked. He didn't get delivered to where he's supposed to go. Kingswell and his entourage, uh, including a fellow named Burwell, who says, no, I'm going to stay. And if you, anybody's been to Virginia looking at the plantations down there, the Burwell Plantation is one of the most uh, famous uh, mm. sites of that period. Burwell stays. He came over on the Mayflower. Another guy named Voy, who attempts, he gets a thousand acres, but that doesn't do too well. But the um, Kingswell says, I've got to go home. I've got to go home. Do you take me home. So in March of 1634, Mayflower sails for home. Soon afterwards, Maryland and Virginia square off in the first naval sea engagements between English-speaking peoples in the Western Hemisphere and the Battle of the Pocomoke. And the Battle of the Pocomoke um, 
is one of the first two battles. William Claiborne loses the first one, wins the second one. And Kent Island is up for grabs, defending Kent Island. But what of the Mayflower? Well, this Mayflower, it's said, one account, has it lost, blown off course, and lost on the uh, Bahama Islands. But a little more research, and we find that that could be so, because Andrews gets home. The reefs of the Bahamas did not claim that Mayflower. Well, the original Mayflower, there's a lot of studies about what happened to the one that went, uh, the one that we think went to uh, Plymouth. There's a number of accounts, and one is that she was broken up, and uh, she was condemned and broken up, and she was put into this church in Jordan's Buckinghamshire, and uh, and you can see what the inside of the church, which looks like uh, timbers that are taken from a ship, which is not unusual. It was disclaimed. It was proven that that is not from a ship of the period of, of the Mayflower. Indeed, the use of uh, shipwrights as architects, as, as carpenters, to build buildings is prominent throughout Europe. If we go to Honfleur, France, we can go to the cathedral there, and if you look at the ceiling, that's two ships that was built by it was built by shipwrights. That's two ships, bottoms upside down, with the fights, with the uh, cross beams and uh, the bracings, logging knees, etc. Well, <clears throat> we have another Mayflower. In 1641, heading for Virginia, gets blown off course and is lost on the Florida Keys on a reef called Los Martires, which we call, I believe, Key Largo today. Um, that reef is, that's very, you, you can find it, right? It's right down. Look, there it is, right there. <laughs> Unfortunately, for those uh, people who came over on that ship, they made it ashore, but the native Indians massacred all but two of them. Two made it back to uh, Fort Matanzas, which is the Span which is a Spanish uh, fortress. Uh, still there if you go to Florida. It's open for tourism. I think uh, Florida State historical society, or maybe it's the National Parks runs it, I'm not sure which. But two of the men made it back to Matanzas, and of course the Spanish, being the Spanish of the day, hating the English, swatted them around a little bit, and sent them home to Spain for further interrogation about Pajiri Santa Maria, and those damned English up there. Well, I tried to find out what happened to them uh, in the archive of the Indies, writing to them about this several times, and of course, got no response. Now, are all of these Mayflowers the same boat? Are they related? Was the Mayflower from Plymouth the same Mayflower that was lost on the Florida Keys? Hmm. Well, we gotta go back to the cases. We can verify that the Mayflower that came to the Chesapeake in 1634 uh, may have been, uh, but we have, to allow, we have to go into the legal cases that erupted. <clears throat> William Claiborne, in war with Lord Baltimore's colony, William Claiborne had established a, a, a trading settlement on, Kent, on uh, Garrett Island. When you're going up Route 95, you're crossing the river, you look down, there's Garrett Island. It was called Fort Conquest. And uh, Lord Baltimore's guys went up there, captured the guys up there, and charged them with piracy for obstructing for seaborne activities and so forth. And William Claiborne had to go home to England to face an admiralty court and in those court records, the story about his relationship with Cloberry and company come out. 
And in those records, the visitation of a Mayflower on the Chesapeake in 1633-34, 13, 14 years after the first settlement uh, in, in uh, Plymouth, are documented. Well, there's another case that comes up. Samuel Vassell is also sued. And Samuel Vassell is sued by Edward Kingswell. And he's sued by Edward Kingswell in court. Now, Vassell is a rich man. He is a wealthy man. He is a merchant. He is a dealer in slaves and ultimately will go to the West Indies to rule out, live out his days. Uh, he ultimately will become a member of Parliament. So he's a very rich and influential man. And he's got friends in high places, but not high enough. He is brought before the court. Well, he is not brought before the court. He is sued. He loses the case, but he only has to pay a couple of hundred pounds for failing to deliver those folks to Carolina. But in that case, uh, there are a number of things that come forth. Um, Vassal himself loses the case, and because he's so haughty, he doesn't show up for the court hearing, and the court throws him in jail. They put him in, uh, in this uh, prison here, Fleet Prison, uh, and he spends a couple days there, and then he pulls some strings and gets out. But what of the Mayflower? Well, there's a lot of people who have looked into this uh, about the Mayflower's history. What happened to the Mayflower? Where did it go? I mean, it is one of the iconic ships of American history. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of the Monitor or the uh, Santa Maria uh, or the Ark and the Dove. Uh, it's, it's really a significant site. Well, William Baker, who is an architect and a historian working all up with the Mystic Seaport, began to document the history of the Mayflower as it had never been documented. The ship, not necessarily the pilgrims. And what he found was that there were, at the time, the 1620 Mayflower sailed for America, there were more than a dozen or so vessels in England called Mayflower. It was a common name. But not all of them were seagoing ships, Atlantic ships. But that did not eliminate it. Uh, the, so it was, a, it was questionable. She was a, a vessel of 100, 180 tons. And the, the fellow on the right, uh, Stuart, Upton is the shipbuilder, and this is the uh, last replica of the ship being built. Uh, a number of times this was done. But the question was, okay, it's a common name. Could this have been the vessel? Could this have been the vessel? That's as far as anybody went. Nobody went to look at the Mayflower of the Chesapeake. The Mayflower lost on the Florida Keys. Well, we were beneficiaries of this project here because um, Will Gates, who becomes the captain of the last Maryland Dove, did his apprenticeship as a ship's rigger on, on the Baker boat. The Mayflower itself, nobody dug into it anymore. We have a great society that is formed around the descendants. We have a great piece of our history built around it. Recent bestseller, Mayflower becomes part of our iconography, um, our advertising. This is a 1920s ad. Um, you can buy $3 Plymouth Rock pants. <laughs> All you got to do. And there's an American Express office waiting for the settlers. <laughs> it becomes part of everything. Mayflower is everywhere. Mayflower is in stores, it's in travel agencies, it's in uh, food. The name Mayflower is something that is an icon. It's a seller. It's the Mayflower Hotel. Where do people go, the great people of America, to party? Where do the politicians go? They go to the Mayflower. Well, but 
Is it the same vessel? Well, we have uh, a number of instances here that are very interesting in these lawsuits. In the last lawsuit against Samuel Vassell, the members of the crew of that Mayflower of 1633-34 are brought to the court. A number of them are shipwrights, a number of them are crewmen. And in the testimony of those crewmen, one of the men, who is a 19-year-old uh, young uh, mariner, testifies that he has made, before coming on that trip, no less than six trips to America under Captain Andrews aboard that Mayflower. Now that comes over in 1633, so going back one voyage a year, which is pushing it, one voyage a year minimum would put that ship at 1627 when he was on board. We have other, others who came on multiple voyages to America as well. Now, the last voyage of a Mayflower to Massachusetts was in 1629. Was it the same ship? Well, in that testimony, which I'm not going to read, and I'm not going to read the testimony, but I do want to read the line from that testimony, which tells us something. The line from that testimony said, identified the Mayflower that came over in 1633-34 as, quote, a ship heretofore called Christopher and Mary, but since named Mayflower. She was the Mayflower of 1629. Vassal was an owner of that ship. We don't know about his ownership of the first Mayflower. And it's my estimation that the first Mayflower ended up just as everybody has been uh, told by the experts that she was condemned on her last voyage, which was she was trading after she came back under her captain, who died in 1622 and was replaced by someone else, possibly Andrews, I don't know. But it was said that that ship was condemned and broken up. I believe that. But I believe that the owners and participants of that project did what a lot of people do and named the next boat Mayflower. So the Mayflower that came to the Chesapeake was probably the last Mayflower to go to New England. It's a complicated story. Was she the one that was lost on the Florida Keys? Well, that is pressing it because 1641 from 1634, uh, um, that's a few years on for a vessel that old. But it could have been. And someday somebody may find it. And I thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Oh, oh, I the insurance company, uh, Lloyd's of London. When, when did they start, and did the record keeping become much more accurate when they there was a global hub? I can't. I can't tell you when Lloyd started. It was in the it was in the early 18th century, I believe, late 17th century. I was well before this. Um, in most of the Lloyd's records that I've looked at, and I've looked at a lot of them. Um, Basically, they have the ship's uh, departures, tonnage, etc., etc., minimum data. And if they're lost, uh, sometimes it will say where they are, sometimes it will not. Uh, I did a, a study of shipwrecks, a lot of them, as you know. Uh, and for the Chesapeake, I went into the Lloyds, which covered, um, I was looking at the 18th century records, which you can find at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News. Some of them are online. They're still in business today. 
and they tell a lot more today. But in those days, basically, they just say, lost Maryland, lost on a reef in Florida, or such and such. So it, it's very broad, uh, broad area. When we start getting newspapers, New England newspapers, for instance, the, the, uh, the Boston Spy of 1621, which is, I think, the year it first starts publishing, it's talking about shipwrecks. The news that is reported is from other places. A captain comes in and says, oh, I passed a ship lost on Cape Hatteras, or such and such. And so um, they're good sources of information, and they get more uh, deep as time goes by. But uh, the early sources, unless you are dealing with um, uh, ownerships, law lawsuits, and that sort of thing, it's really kind of hard to run them down. Yes? Do you say your best estimation is that original ship that came over to Plymouth Rock just went pretty much right back and was condemned at that point? That's your best estimation? No, she, she stayed there uh, until spring. Right. And then she goes home. And she makes another voyage or two to the mainland of Europe, trading voyages. Uh, in March of 1622, her captain dies. He's buried at Rotherheath, which is right across, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to London, but it's right across. I actually um, almost killed myself trying to look at a gravesite there. Uh, but um, the upshot is that she, she was condemned after, the, uh, I think, two voyages to the uh, continent, it's just local trading voyages, really. And then um, the report was that she was condemned. Now, a ship being condemned doesn't mean that it is broken up. It doesn't mean it's lost. Uh, it's not uncommon for ships to be scavenged or to be rebuilt. Um, there's an argument about that with the USS Constellation, uh, which is, you know, kind of an ongoing thing. But um, the, the utilization of ships or ship parts, what constitutes a whole ship, you know, any other questions? Yes. There was, <clears throat> with your talk, there were some things I found very, very interesting. I'd like to know uh, more about with the Spanish expedition to find Roanoke and that they come right. into the Chesapeake. Right. Now, I've got a very interesting, the Potomac, the Spanish name, the uh, Rio, Rio San, San Pedro. Pedro. Hmm. But what I'm very interested in is you're saying that they got up, I would say, to the mouth of the uh, Chesapeake Bay. They went up all the way up to the head of the bay. Head of the bay. Right. And then went over, looking over. Got overland, went, hiked up as far north as, um, as what is the outskirts of Philadelphia. Is there, that's something I did not, I knew of the yeah. attempt about looking for rowing the by the Spain, but the uh, getting into the bay and them looking over and I just, yeah. I, I, know. I know it drove me up the wall when I found out about it. <laughs> uh, two, two, Je two, two Jesuits from Georgetown University, Jesuit priests, uh, were doing, doing research in the 1970s and um, they were going through the Spanish records. Uh, they were dealing with the Spanish attempts at settlement in the Chesapeake Tidewater as, far, as early as 1535. Uh, in 1572, there was, uh, I believe it was a Dominican settlement. Yes. Uh, but the, uh, the objective in 1588 was, it was, it was out, launched out of the Presidio of St. Augustine. And the captain of the ship was a guy named Vicente Gonzalez. And his mission was to uh, identify where this English settlement was because it was a threat to the Spanish treasure fleets, which turn east south of riding the Gulf Currents, turn east from below Cape Hatteras. So here's a settlement on the North Carolina coast, which was, if it became uh, uh, solidified, could be a threat to the Spanish treasure fleets. So they were really concerned. That's why they were concerned about the settlement in, in the Chesapeake, because it was the same thing. Uh, but Gonzalez, um, the account that is about Gonzalez was recorded 
uh, about 30 years later and entered into the archives, the archives of Seville and as part of the, um, the American records. And uh, there it lay. And Lewis and Lily discovered it in, I believe, 1977. And the account goes, and they have found, they have, they have archaeologically excavated um, items of the period in an archaeological dig on a Native American site on the south side of uh, Philadelphia, which, you know, go figure. Did they lose it? You know. Yes, Jonathan. Quick question. The uh, Pamlico Sound, where the port was wiped out in the lost colony. Well, we don't know if it was wiped out or not. Well, they went in and killed all the Indians <coughs> on the island. Well, the, the settlement, what about it? I, I just think once the ships left to go back to England, that's where they disappeared. Uh, well, there's a lot of stories about that. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, questions about where uh, they went. Of course, on the remains of the settlement, when the uh, relief came over, they found Croatan marked in one of the. Uh, well, Croatan Sound is. Well, okay. What does that mean? Well, uh, sometime later, the discovery of peoples, native peoples, blue eyes and blonde hair uh, among the tribes. And the same, the same thing happened out there on the Pacific coast when one of the Manila galleons is lost on the coast, I believe it was Washington or Oregon, uh, and nobody ever found it. But years later when the explorers are out there, they're running across blue-eyed, blonde-haired uh, natives. Um, survivors possibly, you know, or maybe not, but uh, the consequence of, of mixing with the tribes. This is, this was frequent all the way through the Indian Wars. Um, kidnapping, kidnapping a white child and raising it as a, raising it in, in your tribe. So, who knows? Yes? I was just thinking what you said about the Spanish going up. There is a story we heard from a friend who lives in Western Virginia, and apparently when they were building, I think it was I-81 through Virginia, they, they had found some of what they thought was Spanish artifacts during the digging. It was like in the late 70s or early 70s, and they just tossed everything. Well, you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful, for instance, and I will use this as an example. In the entrance to the Amazon, uh, a little port there doing excavations in the water uh, for some industrial stuff. They came up with Roman uh, coins, Roman artifacts, and so forth. And the, the, the first thought is, oh, the Romans were here. <laughs> well, what they found out was that there was ballast stone down there, and the ballast was taken up in the Guadalquivir River in Spain, which at that time, and way back in uh, Roman times was a Roman settlement, and it was from debris dumped, you know, potsherds and stuff dumped overboard or thrown away, and gets dredged up as ballast and ends up in a pile in the Amazon River by another ship which is sunk there. Yeah, there was like a, some Roman coins found off the coast of Beverly, Massachusetts, and that's yeah. probably from the same thing. So you have to be you have to be very careful in identifying something and making that judgment right away. But that's just a story we heard. It's just like they thought yeah. they found these things. And well, Spanish so, coins were were coin of the realm, even in colonial America. Yeah. And yeah, there's I mean that was common. Portuguese time. coins, yeah. And apparently, this was when they were building, and they didn't bother to call anybody. They just tossed it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? Any answers? Well, oh yeah. Well, instead of the bottom line about, um, I know, we always wonder about this. That they don't know, but I'm wondering what you. Thing happened there. If you had to guess, or is there an answer? Well, my the the ship, the last ship coming to the Chesapeake in 16, the last Mayflower coming to the Chesapeake in 1641 was coming directly for Virginia. In 1641, uh, Samuel Vassal becomes a member of Parliament. He is still in, he is still investing in the Western world. He is investing then, at, at that point, in the slave trade in the West Indies. He goes to the West Indies and passes on his days. 
the possibility of that vessel being the same one that came into the Chesapeake, um, it's possible. But the lifespan of a ship, it's iffy. Um, of, in those days, you know, lifespan of a ship was not that long. Although I had found, uh, I went through the merchant vessels of the United States for the year 1900, which has a list of vessels registered in the United States. And I was just doing the ones in the Chesapeake. And I found a vessel that had been built in 1800, and it was still being used in 1900 in the Chesapeake. That's a hundred years of one vessel registered. So I guess anything's possible. But we do know, I am convinced, that the second voyage to Plymouth, uh, or the last voyage, uh, 1629, was the same vessel that came to the Chesapeake based on the testimony, that court testimony, of those folks uh, in this, uh, the vassal case. And th that's in public record. That's in the colonial records. Um, it's in the uh, archives of, of Great Britain. It's, it's here. You can, you can find it. Easy. When will your new book be out? <laughs> Hopefully by the end of this year. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the untold story of one that we don't like to talk about, but it changed the course of American history. So, it's called Siege, the Canadian Campaign in the American Revolution, 1775-1776. So thank you very much.